If you have any questions as I'm speaking, please don't hesitate to get me to slow down to explain it because I want you to understand perfectly well what is at stake when we talk about income inequality and the limits of patient-centered care, which is the new direction in which health research is taking place in this country. I want to start off by telling you the things I'm going to tell you, the things that I don't want you to forget about. Um, here we go. Um, first of all, that our governments will spend money on health care, and how they spend money on health care can make us healthier or less healthy. Um, and it's very important that we get this mix right because it's an awful lot of money. Secondly, that inequality, income inequality, and population aging will accelerate our incidence of chronic disease quite dramatically in the coming 20 years, and it's important that we get that right. Thirdly, slow growth is not going to go away. We've been talking about it a lot in the last year or two because of falling oil prices. But beyond falling oil prices, there are issues about slow growth. And as soon as we get through this period of what's called secular stagnation in the global economy, which just means a long-term period of very slow growth that keeps getting slower, as soon as we come out of that, we will be headlong into a period of population aging, both in Canada and around the world, which will mean that slow, the slow growth agenda will be on our plates for the next 20 years easily, and consequently, we will not be du ducking conversations about budgets and how to contain costs. And part of our job here is to figure out how we bring these issues to the fore so that we are spending money the most effectively to reduce costs as well as improve health. And finally, population health improvements and inter interventions rather can improve the population's health and save costs in a way that patient-oriented care, one person at a time, cannot and will not do. And the key message of everything I'm going to say to you today is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You could have gone and talked to your grandmother to get my key message today. So I'm going to divide this presentation into four bits. First of all, how the economy affects your health directly and indirectly, how government spending affects your health directly and indirectly, what a population health approach could do to save money and improve health, and what you, all of you in this room, as pu uh, public health advocates can do to improve the level of discourse in this country. First of all, let's start with the economic impacts and a summary. I want you to understand very clearly what it means to talk about stalling economic growth, how it's going to affect your work, and how it's going to affect your health. Um, as I said, we'll be talking about the indirect and direct health impacts and how that also leads to budgetary pressure. Slow growth means less revenues, means more debate on how your taxes should go up, down, or sideways, and how that money should be spent. First of all, let's look at the growth effect in general. The global economy outlook is slowing down. The IMF just put out new uh, forecasts last week. I, I wish I'd included this. I think I've included this in your, in your charts about how every time they put out a growth outlook, which is in April of every year, the charts have been coming down slower and slower. Since April of 2010, we've seen slowing gro growth globally. And in the uh, global growth context, Canada's slowdown is faster than most. And it isn't just the last price decline of oil. More importantly is the fact that population aging effects slow down the economy. Why is that? Old people spend less money than young people. That's partly because they have less income, but also that they have different needs than young, younger populations. So when we go from 10% of the population that is over 65, to 25% of the population that is over 65, you have an automatic growth slowdown right there. And that's where we're headed in the course of the next 15 years. But let me just make it clear that growth is not the solution because faster growth doesn't necessarily mean better health. Why? Because in the last 30 years, faster growth has meant more inequality. And more inequality has meant worse health for the population as a whole. So, what does it mean indirectly on your health when uh, growth slows, economic growth slows? First of all, for a business perspective, you've got slowing rates of return. So you see that when you put your money in savings accounts. You're seeing less and less return on your deposits in a bank for 
publicly traded companies as well as private companies where you're, you're just seeing less return on your investment. But it's problematic for publicly traded companies who need to know that their share price is at least staying in place if not going up. How do publicly traded companies make sure that they are the apple of the investor's eye? How do they stay popular for investors? Well, they do it by increasing their profits. How do you increase profits if spending is declining? Exhibit A, Walmart. Exhibit B, McDonald's. They're having same store sales declining. Why? Because of slowing economic growth. Wages are stagnant and people are spending less money on these things. And consequently, you are not getting higher profits through strictly growth. In fact, you're getting lower profits through growth. Yet profitability in Canada is at a 27 year high. How, the, how can that be? Well, there are three mechanisms that publicly traded companies in particular use. First of all, they go to cost constraints. So they will pay their workers less. They will introduce two-tier uh, wages. They will outsource their jobs. They'll do anything they can to constrain wage costs and anything in the supply chain that can reduce costs. So you constrain costs, you increase profits. The second thing they do is they spin off the less profitable parts of their businesses. And so you're seeing co companies that are spinning off uh, parts of their business that just are not core competencies. This looks an awful lot like it did in the 1990s. And that means that what's left of the company has higher profitability rates. Right? So you just dump the stuff that doesn't make the same profits. We're seeing that a lot, for example, in fish processing. They're making 10% rates of return, but that's not as much as the rate of return that they want. 15% is what they want. That's their target. So they spin off the parts that have less of a rate of return than the profit level that they've targeted. And the third is through mergers and acquisitions, which we're seeing an awful lot of uh, in the wake of the crisis. And it's in fact mergers and acquisitions. Think Tim Hortons and Wendy's, for example. It's the mergers and acquisitions that permit the bottom line to look like it is soaring, not because they have higher sales for the things that they used to do, but because the merger of these two entities per permits uh, a growth in volume as well as an opportunity to constrain costs more. So you get overlapping functionalities, which you dismiss, that raises the profitability. So I mentioned that profits are at a 27 year high in Canada, despite slowing growth, but the wage share of GDP is, at, is near a record low, and that affects your health this way. So first phase of the direct health effects of slow growth. First of all, as you lose your jobs in a slow growth environment, there are few, fewer job options out there. So consequently, people hang on to the jobs they've got. They don't leave them as easily. And it's harder to find an opening in a, another decent job. Secondly, that means more people are competing for entry level jobs. And there are more young people. And there are more immigrants. So the pool of competition at the very bottom of the job market, where the wages are the shallowest, are far, is far more aggressive. And that also suppresses wages at the bottom. Secondly, there's more two-tier workplaces. You will find many companies that have unions negotiating with those unions to say, well, you're OK. We won't touch your wages or your benefits. But the next hires that come in will get lower wages and less benefits. So that's by structure, even within, within unionized environments and certainly outside of unionized environments, you're seeing a reduction of pay and benefits for younger people and newcomers into the business. That means inadequate retirement income, incomes down the road. It means less coverage through the workplace for drugs, dental, and uh, vision. And it means people will end up, more people over time will be working when they shouldn't be working because it's unsafe or because they're sick and they should be at home, but they can't afford not to work. The whole combination of things actually lowers uh, the uh, returns to work for the bottom of the labor market. And let me give you some examples of what that means. So we have seen a remarkable growth in temporary work since the crisis. The, uh, the arrow there is pointing to the October 2008 crisis, the intersection of the red and uh, black lines. You'll see prior to the crisis from 1997 to two, for basically for the decade of commodity booms, the number of permanent jobs was quite steady going up. Um, the number of temporary jobs, which is the red line, varied quite dramatically. Um, just before the crisis, you'll see here that's 2007, was at the peak. Temporary jobs are always the canaries in the coal mine. They were the first to be let go. But since the crisis, 
The fastest growing rate of job creation has been amongst temporary jobs, growing roughly five times faster than the creation of permanent jobs. People will say, well, actually, when you look at the relationship of temporary to permanent work, it hasn't changed that much over the, uh, the uh, tighter of the entire labor market because there are so many permanent jobs. But what I want you to pay attention to here is the people that are saying, this is the black, this is the black line. What's the proportion of temporary jobs of all jobs? And the black line is everybody. So we've gone from 11.3% to 13.4% over the course of the last, whatever that is, 15 years or so. Uh, a bit more than 15 years. So it isn't much of a bump up and there wasn't a huge change after the crisis and it's kind of flattened out. That's because there are more older workers, particularly baby boomers with permanent jobs. That's, uh, and the, the real change is taking place amongst people that are 15 to 24 years old. So that young generation is really where the change is happening in the future job market. And of course that will lead to job scarring and wage, sorry, wage scarring over the course of people's lives. Because uh, temporary work is the sine qua non of not knowing how much income you're gonna have over the course of your life. And that is the new normal in a number of workplaces. So that is a trend that we should be taking uh, a very hard look at, if you take a look at the change, it's gone from one in four jobs to almost one in three jobs now amongst young people are temporary. That has long-term effects. And finally, the third way in which work has become more temporary is the rise of temporary foreign workers instead of economic immigrants. As a way of dealing with labor shortages, the black line are economic immigrants. You will see that since 2007, since the crisis, we have actually doubled, over doubled, the entry of immigrants into this country. But it is a brand new phenomenon of replacing, uh, trying to meet our labor shortage needs with migrant workers, which also suppresses wage, um, wages and uh, benefits that workers can expect. So that has, uh, that has a spillover effect on the rest of the economy. So I've, I've been talking a lot about what uh, a slow growth environment does to your health. Uh, at the bottom of the income spectrum, but it's not, it's never just the bottom. When we're talking about inequality and slow growth, uh, we're looking also at what happens to the middle. There are fewer jobs in the middle of the income spectrum, and we're looking at what happens at the top. So yes, there has been growth. I told you that the profit rates are now at 27 year highs. So there's been growth. We've seen income concentration and wealth concentration. And income con concentration, I'll show you these charts in a couple of minutes, leads also to spatial uh, uh, polarization. The reason being that if you've got only one group with a windfall of income gains, they are going to be driving the price of housing, right? They are going to find the places that are the most attractive. What's real estate about? Real estate is about location, location, location. So there are certain locations that are preferential. And people gravitate towards those preferential locations and those with extra money drive up the price of those locations. But that has a spillover uh, uh, effect in adjacent neighborhoods, slowly driving up the, stock, the, the price of the entire stock of housing, but polarizing communities in the meantime, reinforcing the fact that there's less mobility. Because what is a low rent neighborhood? A low rent neighborhood is someplace where not only is the stock of housing not adorable, but you've got worse schools, less public transit, less retail, less green space and recreational spot. It's called low rent housing because nobody wants to live there. And people that live there are only living there because they can't afford to live someplace else. And now I will show you some pictures about that. Oh wait, no, I'm going to tell you something else first. I forgot about this. So income inequality is rising in Canada, right? Well, here's the traditional way of looking at income inequality internationally is the Gini coefficient, which, by the way, is terrible at measuring what's happening at both ends of the income spectrum. It is excellent at measuring what's happening in the middle of the income spectrum. I will not bore you with the math as to why this Gini coefficient does what it does, but it's basically telling you what's happening in the middle. And what this is telling you is happening in the middle is that from 1976 to 1997, income inequality went up dramatically in the marketplace. Our tax and transfer system, the red line, subdued it, but still you saw a dramatic growth till 1997. 
And then post-1997, you're not seeing much difference. So the people that are the income inequality deniers, the equivalent of the climate change deniers in our society, the income inequality deniers in Canada will say, stop talking about income inequality as if it is an issue in Canada. You are importing this problem from the United States. And of course, nobody does extreme like the United States. And we are no United States. Take a look at that line. It is flattened out. There is no problem. Stop whining. OK, that's the chart they're referring to, Gini coefficients. So did I tell you that it's measuring what's happening in the middle, right? Let me show you what's happening at the tail. So just do a Monet moment. Blink your eyes and take a look at the, sh the shape of that curve. So it rises until the late 20s, I mean, sorry, the, the late 20th century, and then flattens out in the first few years of the next 20th century, uh, of the next century, OK? Now take a look at this. We have the opposite curve. This is the polarization of the top 20 to the bottom 20. I'm not even talking about the fabled 1% here. We're talking about the relationship of the top 20% of Canadians to the bottom 20% of Canadians. Flat, 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 flat. This is taxes and transfers at work till 1995 and then up and hasn't stopped going up since. So it's the opposite of the Gini coefficient. So where you're looking in the distribution will tell a very different story. And this is the polarization I was telling you about. Let me show you again what happened to the middle. This is, the, this is three income groups. 50% um, of the population of Canada earns less than $30,000. Chew on that for a minute. 50% of the population of Canada earns less than $30,000 in Canada in 2011. Fewer people now make between thirty dollars and $60,000. And more people make over 60000 So you've got fewer opportunities to earn a middle income living than you did in 1976. This is all in inflation adjusted dollars. More opportunities to earn under 30000 That's because there's a lot more part-time work today than there was in the, the mid-1970s. And more opportunities to make more than 60000 This is a modest but important trend in income polarization. Now, I want you to think about what you just saw. I want to show you, look at the titles of the last three uh, slides, on the slides itself. 1976 to 2011, 1976 to 2011, 1976 to 2011. Why 2011? We're in 2015. Because the federal government changed the survey, which looks at what kind of incomes we have. And we have a brand new survey called the Canadian Income Survey that was released in, 2000, in December of 2014, providing us with 2012 information, at which point they told us, well, you can't actually use that information to look at what happened historically because this survey isn't comparable to those data. And we will give you some new information with historical comparability by about 2015. My God, is that convenient, is it not? We've got one intervening event between now and 2015. It's called an election. We're talking about income trends in Canada going up to 2011, um, and we are sitting in 2015. OK, now I resume. This is uh, still going up to 19, uh, 2011, but this is the story about income inequality in Canada. From 1990, 1976 to 1997, the story of income inequality in Canada was driven by the poor. What happened to people during recessions? They get knocked out of the labor market, their incomes plummet, and then they try and get back in. That drove income inequality, what happened at the bottom. But after 1997, what drove income inequality, as you can see, everybody's income has improved. But what drove income inequality was the degree to which the richest group, the richest 20% of society, improved more than anybody else. Now, the income inequality deniers will tell you, really, you are talking about envy. What is to worry about if the bottom is improving and the top is improving. Everybody's better. Don't worry, be happy. I'll tell you why we should be worried about this. Because of this. So not only is the top improving better than anybody else, it has seen greater gains from income growth than any group has seen before in our history. These charts go back to the 1920s. This is the roaring 20s. This is how much of the gains from income growth the top 1% got in the 1920s. 17% of all income growth accrued to the top 1%.
You see, in the 1930s and 40s during the war years, much smaller percentage. In the 40s and 50s, reconstruction, bigger but still very attenuated, 50s to 60s, 60s to 70s, and then, okay, here we start. 1977, it starts creeping up. 87 to 97, when I first did these numbers, I thought, oh, okay, 87 to 97, that's an eye popper. It's almost 30% of all income growth going to 1% of the population. But maybe you can understand that because the recession in 1990 and 91 was so appallingly bad that maybe because people were sidelined for so long out of the labor market, the 1% actually got more of the income gains. But there is nothing, ladies and gentlemen, to explain this. 1997 to 2007 saw one of the fastest rates of job growth in Canada in our history. We outpaced any other G7 nation in terms of job creation as a proportion of our economy. If you cannot reduce income inequality at a time like this, when can you reduce it? That is a warning sign. So let me go to the income polarization argument, because I'm telling you income polarization leads to spatial polarization, which means you've got problems that, that are deeply embedded in health as well, I'm going to show you three charts. This is done by the United Way of Greater Toronto. It uses um, census data, which we can no longer do study like this because we don't have appropriate census data to do it. But I'm going to show you what we do know for the period we've got. Red dots here, three, three neighborhoods that have got uh, po poverty rates of over 40%. The turquoise dots are poverty rates 26% to 40%. The yellow areas are 13% to 26% poverty rates, and the white areas are, we're doing okay. You don't need to worry about poverty. That's 1970, sorry, 81. 1991, we have more areas that are red, and more areas that are blue, and more areas that are yellow. And here's 2001, and you see a proliferation of red, yellow, and blue, and you see that what is left as a I'm okay Jack area is getting surrounded by areas that are less um, uh, affluent. So we're seeing a kind of closing in of, uh, it's the, some people call this the Manhattanization of Toronto. And the person that did this study for the United Way of Greater Toronto learned, learned this technique from David Holchansky, whose work I will show you here. So this is David Holchansky took census data from 1970 to 2010 by the neighborhoods and uh, sorted out the number of neighborhoods that were very low income, low income, middle income, high income, and very high income. The group, the only group that fell was the middle income group. The group that rose most quickly was low income, sorry, the group with the biggest increase was low income. The fastest increase was very low income. And the second fastest income was, uh, increase was very high income. David Holchensky has done this work for Vancouver, for Montreal. Uh, this is, and he's been one of the foremost uh, complainers that we can no, no longer do this work using census data. And of course, place-based health disparities. We're looking at code red. This is a Hamilton exercise that the newspaper underdid using census data again. And their, their more recent, most recent piece of work showed a, a, a difference of 21 years in life expectancy in adjacent neighborhoods, rich and poor neighborhoods, which is a generation's worth. Basically, you're discounting a generation. If you think this isn't worth fixing, you got a problem. So how do we fix slow growth? Well, we know in this room that the way to fix slow growth is not necessarily goose up the economy, but to actually address the causes of ill health, which are the determinants of health. So faster growth can cause more income inequality and polarization, but slower growth will also accentuate income inequality. That doesn't mean that our hands are tied. We know how to do this. We were talking about this in a master class this morning. If you provide universal access to certain basic benefits, for example, dental care in the case of what we were talking about this morning, you, or you have affordable, uh, affordable post-secondary education, you have affordable access to childcare and recreation opportunities universally in every neighborhood, you might still get polar income polarization and the, the breaking apart of where people choose to live, but you are offsetting that income polarization by providing universally high quality living standards. And that might be just enough to prevent um, to prevent more of what's called positive sorting. In uh, economics, there's a term called uh, positive sorting that Gary Becker put into place. 
I'm going to convert that into your grandmother's language again. Birds of a feather flock together. Doctors marry doctors. Lawyers marry lawyers. Instead of in our parents' generation when doctors married nurses and lawyers married male, male carriers. I don't think so. Uh, but anyway, you know, like there was, there was a little bit more mixing it up between income classes than there is now. Now people marry likes because they actually don't rub shoulders with one another in different environments as frequently as they used to. Now the problem with my pr proposition that we address the determinants of health in every neighborhood in equivalent ways is that slow growth will affect budgets and what, what, what you're seeing it with the Quebec budget, we're about to see it with the federal budget, we're seeing it played out in, in jurisdiction after jurisdiction, we ain't got no money to fix this. What we have to do is cut because what we have to do is balance our books. I beg to disagree. How our governments spend will affect our health today and in 20 years from now. And in this uh, period where we've got this epidemic of austerity, we are avoiding the elephant in the room. The fact that population aging and growing inequality presage an epidemic of preventable illnesses like obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular, these are to some extent preventable early death and preventable illness. And our solution at the federal level on what kind of research we fund has said, well, let's look at patient-centered care. That's the latest policy jargon that I keep running across over and over again. What does patient-centered care mean to you? I'll tell you what it means to me when I look at this is something that I'm now seeing on my TV in hotel rooms that I'm at, which is spend 200 bucks and get 123 genetic tests so you know what you've got a like predisposed conditions for. This is patient-centered care, nanotechnology, diagnostics, medication that will target exactly what's wrong with you, one person at a time. Let me just tell you we don't have enough money for fixing this one person at a time. But we do have enough money to prevent an explosion in chronic diseases. So, and if we did that, we could actually reduce not only our costs because we are doing a pound, uh, sorry, an ounce of prevention instead of a pound of cure, but we could actually reduce the number of patients. How awesome would that be if we had a healthier population? We would be reducing all sorts of human costs as well. And my tag for this presentation is improve health, save money. Now my colleagues in the pub, pub, public health sphere don't love this tag, improve health, save money. And the reason for it is multiple, and we'll get into it in a second. In fact, do I get into it? No, I'll get, I'll get into, I, I, I just flagged that my colleagues do not love the tagline, improve health, save money, which I think you should be living by this screed in all the work that you do in public health, but I'll tell you why they don't like it, and they're right. But I think I've got a better argument. The reason why we should be talking about this in this way is in an environment of slow growth for at least the next 15 or 20 years, we are constantly going to be debating that we don't have enough money to fix things. This is going to be the new normal. And if austerity goes on for 15 or 20 more years, which it did in, like we've had austerity in Ontario for 20 years already, and it's getting worse. If austerity is the new normal for another 20 years, we are absolutely guaranteeing that we will be spending more money on things that we didn't need to spend money on. So in fact, we in the public health domain need to convert this conversation to, in slow growth, the thing that governments must do is actually reduce costs and improve health. And this can be done with population health interventions and in, on investments in the social determinants of health. You cannot cut your way to growth. This is an absolute false economy that is being presented to us as taxpayers without looking at, uh, as taxpayers today, without looking at what happens down the road. When a government says to you today, I'm going to give you your money back in the form of a tax cut, they're saying, I don't want to fix the things that I can fix with that money, but I'm going to charge you more to fix them later on when they're more costly to fix. I'm just going to remind you. This is about an ounce of prevention being worth a pound of care, and if public, public health experts cannot bring this narrative to the fore, we are not doing our job. You are not doing your job. So I think we should be talking about how we can invest in how to reap those rewards, which we know in healthcare can take 15, 20 years to come, but if we don't do this today, 
we were going to be spending guaranteed more money down the road at a time when population aging collides with public finance in a way that guarantees everybody's going to be worried about whether we have enough taxes because there's fewer revenues with older population and more demands on public health care. And the squeeze play that we've been hearing about every decade for the last 20 years is going to be a reality and it is preventable. So the investments are not just in hard infrastructure that we need it. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities estimates that we have $172 billion in unmet deficit of municipal infrastructure, which is fixing the sewer systems, fixing the roads, fix fixing the water supply system, fixing the electricity transmission grids. These are the things that our parents' generation built 60 years ago or more, and we keep wanting our tax cuts, and so we defer fixing them, but they get more and more costly to fix. So it's not like that's going to get any cheaper to fix down the road. But I'm also talking about soft infrastructure, human capital investments, investments in early childhood education, investments in health care, in public health interventions that keep people healthy instead of just fix them when they, when they get sick, and investments in post-secondary education. Oh, I, I've already done this, haven't I? OK, so I'm not going to redo this. Except to say the last point. I'm going to reinforce the last point. When the government says to you, I'm giving you back your taxes, it's saying not only I don't want to do the hard stuff, go shopping, but it's also saying I don't want to do what the private sector can't and won't do. The public sector is not the same as the private sector. When you get more money in your pocket, when they tell you, you know how to spend your money better than I do, so go shopping, they don't say you can buy different things than I can provide you through public dollars. There are things that the government does that the private sector doesn't do because it can't do. It makes no sense for the private sector to create whole public transit infrastructure to, to regulate. You can't self-regulate certain types of uh, expenditures on human services. And the private sector has no incentive on saving the population costs. In fact, that's where profits come from. Make them spend, make them spend more. In fact, in healthcare in particular, healthcare is 11% of our economy. If the private sector had, had, the, had their way, it would be a, an economy generating juggernaut. We could bump that up to 15%, 16% of the economy, and somebody's going to make a lot of profits. In fact, what governments do is say, we can do these things without profits and still de deliver a better quality for a bigger number of people. The idea of the public good is something that we don't talk about enough. So how government's spending affects your health is through prevention. And let me show you, if you think that saving money and improving health is not possible. Let me show you a few very, very specific examples. Tobacco cessation. This is smoking prevalence on your left-hand side. Down, 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 down since 1965. Actually, significantly down even before we had official uh, smoking cessation programs, which started roughly around here. But the rate has increased. This is interesting, and I want public health epidemiologists to tell me about this. So the rate of lung cancer de decreased for males, the blue line. It has increased for females. Why is that? Because the rate of smoking also decreased for females, right? The red line, again, for females. This is something that science should be going for, yes? Not now, because he's filming. <laughs> but you can tell us later, yeah? But the point is that we know that pop population health interventions can save money and improve health. That's one example. We can reduce death by car. OK, so this is the incidence of uh, death rates in motor vehicle accidents. How did we do that? Population health interventions in the form of speed limits, seat belts, and airbags. Save money, improve health. Another example, putting our money where our mouth is. So the, the picture on the left is the guy before and after dental care. He was 20 years old in, both, in his early 20s in both of these pictures, a guy named Jason. He was poor. His teeth fell out. Well, his, no, his teeth rotted. And the only solution for him, since he didn't have dental care, is to get his teeth extracted. That was the solution that Medicare offers, because we don't cover oral health in Medicare. But we will cover emergency extraction. So he had most of his teeth extracted. Somebody saw a picture of him. Moira Welsh in the Toronto, store, uh, Toronto Star wrote a story about his life. Some dentists came forward 
They offered to give him free dental care. He got a job, he got a girlfriend, he got a kid, he got a house. He got a haircut, he looks great. And this was such a great story that we, we I, I insisted that we feature, feature his picture on the front of this particular CCPA publication. Here I want to bring your attention to the cost per capita on dental care in this country in the private sector, line going up, the cost in the public sector, flat as a pancake, so some of what's going on in the private sector is you want your teeth whitened, you want your teeth straightened, go for it. Like, I don't care if you want to spend your own personal money on that. Some of that cost is just extracting rotten teeth. We have a higher incidence of or poor oral health in immigrant populations and in First Nations populations. In both cases, because milk is not considered, well, in the case of First Nations population, because milk is more expensive than Coke, in many reserves, and in the case of immigrant populations, here, child, have Coke, because I could have milk in the country I came from, but Coke is cheap here, and it is a status symbol. And so you have all these blackened teeth in, in class. There are simple fixes to that, and that would reduce that incredible gradient. We could improve health, reduce costs. Let me show you some of the ways we could do that. Fluoridation is probably one of the best ways of doing that. Overall ranking, this is by, oh, I forget who did this. This is like a scientist, not me, ranking this stuff. Uh, fluoridation, sealant programs, toothbrushing, you see the ranking order of actually improving health. This is cheap, cheap, cheap stuff to do. Improve health, save costs. How? Through public health interventions. Invest in human capital and start young. This is what happens when you invest in human capital. You reduce the cost later on in life. So do I have the, yes, Fortes study. Okay, so this is an American thing that shows that for every dollar invested in four uh, Head Start programs in the United States, $4, $7, $5, $4 were returned for every dollar of public intervention. So it pays for itself in Quebec where you have far more public programs than many of the places in which these uh, interventions took place, still in Quebec, for every dollar spent as a subsidy for childcare in Quebec, the provincial government got a dollar four in new revenues, and the federal government got a total windfall of four, 43 cents for every dollar spent. It more than pays for itself. I think you know Monsieur Fortin's work in this province. He's no left-leaning liberal, this work speaks for itself, that you can save money and improve health. You getting this message? You can save money and improve health. <laughs> and if you invest in early childhood education, this goes back to the polarization charts I was showing you, the, uh, the, the fact that we uh, are segregating ourselves. 50% of kids in Canada start school not ready to learn in low-income neighborhoods. We can make that different. In, in many schools, when you have low SES, low socioeconomic indicators, kids don't graduate from high school. We can change that. We can improve health and save money. And if we put money in our dental care programs, if we actually invested in kids aged 5 to 14, as they did in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, uh, in the late 1970s and 1980s, if we only covered 85% of kids, we would save money and improve health at a tiny, tiny fraction of what we currently uh, provide. I hope you're getting my message. <laughs> this is another example on Housing First. I'm just keeping my eye on the clock and I'm realizing we're running out of time, so I just want to make get to my point here. If it's possible, to improve health and save money, why are we not talking about it all the time? Well, the scientists among you will say we can't prove, we can't prove causality. We can show correlation, and even so, evidence might come out over time that shows it wasn't that that led to this. And then, you know, the fact is maybe the politicians want to save money <coughs> instead of improve health, or maybe the politicians want to improve health, but it doesn't save money. What if you can't do both of those things, Armin? Think about it. You can't actually always make that claim. You can improve health and save money, damn straight. But in the event that we are stuck in a budgetary dispute, that all we can do is cut and provide austerity, if you have not made the link that that will lead to worse health down the road and higher costs, you have missed your boat, ladies and gentlemen. You have missed doing your due diligence as scientists in explaining to us it is possible and we do have evidence to improve health 
and save money. You might not do it all of the time, but let us at least talk about what we can do as a society to improve health and save money because we are not going to be able to do this one patient at a time. And therefore, I think it is not just your due diligence to produce good evidence. And it's not enough just to provide evidence-based ways to improve lives. You have to prove that some of the decisions that are being made right now cost too much. And there we have the Alberta Chief Medical Officer of Health two weeks ago coming together with many health, uh, <clears throat> many health professionals saying, we've got $7 billion deficit in our budget, and it is going to make people's health worse. They are taking the moment to start linking deficits and economic growth to health. In Quebec, you've got a law that says we must assess the health impact of every decision we make through the lens of health. I don't hear you guys. I can't hear you. You need to be out there talking about this. And you've just had a third of your budget in public health cut. Why? Because you were maybe too effective. Maybe you were too effective. But you know, it doesn't matter if you have got uh, your budget's cut. It's not about you telling them how to grow the economy or how they grow, grow it. Sometimes health gets in the way of making money and you have to be brave enough to say that highway proposal, that mining uh, uh, decision, the idea of serving alcohol at casino tables, these are bad ideas. You might be making more money but it's worse for health and that is your job. That is your job and if you lose your funding because of it, well then, that means you just have to focus more. You have to get more strategic. You have to decide what are the short-term games we're going after. And what are the long-term games we're going after? And how do these things intersect so we've got continuous momentum? What are the key messages? Every file you take on, you have to have a key demand. It isn't just like, we want better health. Oh, no, no, no. What is it that you're stopping? What is it that you're starting? We want X amount of money in the schools to improve public health of dental care. You have to have clear, distinguishable acts asks that are based on solid evidence, but are not just about evidence. And for heaven's sake, choose the facts that you want to get repeated. Understand that education in this file is a long, long process. The story of tobacco cessation is a 30-year story. We don't have 30 years. Pick your fights well. Pick the facts that you want to have the public on the street repeat over and over again, not your colloque of you know, scientists repeating over and over again, the facts that everybody on the street can repeat over and over again and make demands of their politicians, say yes to every media request, use the social media more effectively, force yourself to 140 characters of pithy examples of what we can do to what? Say it with me. Improve health, save money. And understand your power. Public health, that domain is full of the most striking human dramas, right? It is about, it is the secular parable. It is about, here's the adversity and here's the solution. Here's the stories and the values that people can relate to. It is a humane instinct to want to reduce early death and suffering. To pay, it, is, it is a noble thing to say we are putting people ahead of financial gain. We understand the drive to want to fix everybody's health one person at a time, but making money is not how we should be doing it. We know that he public health is about talking about inequalities and offsetting injustices, and it's about making things more accessible for everybody, better health for all. And we know how to use scale to our advantage. Public health saves lives too, a million lives at a time. What are your slogans? What are you going to have people repeat after you? What would make people march in the street, not because of a 0.4 cut, to uh, education, but because they want something. Not because they're trying to stop something, but because they want to march in the streets to have something. Better health, improved health, and saved costs. Yes, you can. I thank you for inviting me to be part of the Paul Bernard lecture series. I applaud him for the work that he brought to all of us. And, you know, I just think I'm very happy to be in this midst today. I entertain your questions if you have any. I'm sorry it took me so long to get through this slide deck. <laughs>